Okay, folks, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to the first uh, seminar of the uh, MAE seminar series for the spring. Um, I've got a few things that I want to go over first. Many of you are probably fam familiar with how the class works, but uh, we may have some new folks. We'll have 10 seminars, one each week. I've put up a course website that already has all the speakers um, laid out, and most of them have their abstracts by now, so you can check them out before, um, before we come. We will use Canvas for attendance, so you can see uh, when you log into Can Canvas whether you have attendance marks for the time. So you're required to come to this 
seminar, but you get two no questions asked uh, skips. And if you want to miss anything beyond that, you need to get a pre-approval for the reason, and you're also going to have to watch the video afterwards and, and write a short summary of the uh, talk that you watched. Okay? So that's it's pretty basic. Um, uh, just um, come, watch the talks, and hopefully ask, ask some nice questions, too. Uh, the speakers will always appreciate that. Lastly, uh, your attendance is recorded via the sign-in sheet, which will be passed around each time. So put your name and student number on that. And one thing, next week this lecture is, is not going to happen in this room. We're actually going to be in Social Sciences 1100, and I'll send out an email. Um, we have a wheelchair user that's going to be the presenter, and this stage doesn't work. So that's the Death Star up further on campus if you want to. So you've got to walk, walk away. It's probably a five to ten minute walk to get over there. And I'll send out a reminder. For that. Okay, so today we have uh, Dr. Leo Louis. He um, received his Bachelor of Science degree from Zhejiang University in China in 2004, and he got his Ph.D., at Purdue University in Indiana in 2010. He's an assistant professor here in the Electrical and Computer Engineering Department, and he is going to join our graduate group this year, and uh, we'll be able to take on graduate students like you all for projects that he's working on. He works in uh, MIMS and other rec reconfigurable high-frequency components, um, and uh, does applications in biomedical and industrial applications with these devices. So I'll give the floor to Dr. Louis, and um, thank you for coming. All right, thank you, Jason, for the introduction. Am I loud enough? Oh, I see. We don't. Have, okay, okay. I see. Okay. Um, so let's, I guess, get started. Um, I'm uh, quite honored to be here to be able to present uh, to an audience that is, uh, I guess, different from my typical audience who who <laughs> who would know uh, quite a bit about electrical engineering. But I am an assistant professor in the electrical engineering department, and um, I work on my primary research interest is in high-frequency electronic circuits and uh, systems. Uh, but during my PhD uh, degree, uh, I worked a fair bit with uh, MEMS devices, microelectromechanical <coughs> systems. And these are basically uh, very small mechanical structures. And we, as electrical engineers, we use them uh, to change properties in an electrical circuit, just as, uh, uh, as you it would turn on and off uh, the switch, a circuit breaker that makes contact and breaks off the contact in order to turn uh, the light on and off. Uh, we use these devices to change certain characteristics, like turning on part of a circuit and turning it off uh, in an electrical circuit. So uh, today I'm going to talk about some of the work and maybe uh, before that, a little bit of introduction of MEMS devices applied to high-frequency electronics uh, in general. Uh, so. We'll just get started. So MEMS, uh, again, microelectromechanical system, is not a distant uh, concept, uh, I guess, particularly to, to this audience. Um, they, MEMS based devices have been used uh, more and more widely. So here I have probably a little bit outdated example. Uh, this is a Wii uh, controller, uh, it's a gaming controller which can sense your uh, gestures, uh, I guess. Uh, and inside it, uh, what is enabling the sensing is some MEMS devices that c are capable of measuring acceleration and rotation. And today we have these sensors, uh, you know, not in a specific gaming uh, controller, but also in our cell phones as well. So here are some, uh, for example, a dye photograph of a gyroscope inside uh, our iPhones. Okay. So uh, what you're looking at here looks like an integrated circuit, but uh, in, in reality, we have some moving parts in here. So these are silicon uh, devices etched out of a silicon wafer that can uh, resonate or move back and forth. And their resonance uh, is able to give us uh, information on acceleration and rotation. And there are obviously peripheral circuits that are used to read out 
uh, these uh, information. So, again, in this talk, in this talk uh, I'm primarily interested in MEMS devices, these very small scale devices being applied to high frequency electronics. And so we'll look at these in particular. Um, you know, MEMS devices have obviously a lot, uh, a lot of applications across many disciplines, but uh, in this talk, we're just focusing on electronic applications. Okay, and here I have uh, an exemplary device that uh, we study a lot in RF MEMS. And here we have what we call a RF MEMS switch. Its composition is quite simple. Right? If we uh, look at the structure, what you're seeing here is essentially a suspended beam on top of a planar uh, substrate. And on the other end, right, so if the beam is made of a conductive material, on the other end, we could put another conductive trace. And by making contact or breaking contact, you are essentially realizing the function of a switch, just as a circuit breaker on the, on the wall. So you turn, you can use this to turn on and off a circuit, or maybe part of a circuit. For example, you can uh, add certain components to your circuit for tuning purposes, uh, and you can disconnect those components uh, as you desire. So the advantage here is that these devices are relatively small, and we're talking about micrometer dimensions. And uh, this example device is about 100 meter long. The actual beam is about 75, uh, 100 micrometer long, uh, 75 micrometer. And the material here is made of uh, gold, uh, a common material in electronics as uh, it's a fairly inert uh, uh, element and doesn't oxidize very easily. Okay? And the great advantage here is that these kind of devices, when we use them as a switch, it works really, really well in terms of its electrical performance because this is essentially the best switch you can get in terms of uh, uh, the switch loss and the contact resistance. So we're talking about two pieces of gold making contact uh, with each other. And here we have a fairly small uh, contact resistance. So when we use uh, these devices as a switch, essentially we're talking about two states. An on state where we make a connection and it just looks like a short circuit ideally and in reality it may present a little bit of a contact resistance. And the off state where you do not have uh, a connection. Right? The two parts are broken apart. And we will talk about how uh, we make this contact and break the contact in a little bit. Okay. So um, in the electrical world, uh, we have uh, switches for a long time, especially in integrated circuit technologies. Uh, we have uh, fairly decent switches. And usually these switches are made out of transistors. And you might know that transistors are getting smaller and smaller every day. Uh, so these transistor switches, they are uh, fairly nice in a few aspects. For example, they are very small and th therefore you can make a lot of them in a very small uh, space. And then they are very, very fast. We're talking about nanosecond or picosecond of uh, 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 switching speed. Okay? But they do have some disadvantages right, when we're talking about uh, switches based on transistors. For those of you who have taken a uh, electronics course that covers basic properties of transistors, we know that they are inherently nonlinear devices, whether it is a field effect transistor or a bipolar transistor. Uh, in the on state, you can approximate its response with a resistor, but it's not really a very ideal resistor. It has some nonlinearity built in. And we're also, with advanced technologies, we're talking about uh, a certain lower bias voltage, which also limits uh, their power handling capabilities. Okay. And uh, some variant of the switches, for example, a bipolar switch or maybe a switch that is based on diodes, they consume current when you turn them on and off. So uh, there are certain level of power consumption associated when you uh, use these switches. And they are fairly lossy in general when you go to high frequencies. And here we talk about high frequencies uh, in the range of hundreds of megahertz uh, to a few gigahertz to a few tens of gigahertz and maybe even a few hundred uh, gigahertz. So uh, 
uh, as you all know, the cell phones that we use today are primarily in the range of uh, between 700 megahertz, the operating range, frequency range is uh, between 700 megahertz to about 2.7 gigahertz. Right? The next generation, there is a lot of uh, talk about the fifth generation wireless communication networks. Uh, people are now start talking about 20 to 30 gigahertz of operation frequency. So at these high frequencies, uh, the loss characteristics becomes very important because as a switch, your function is to connect and disconnect a circuit, but you don't want to cause unnecessary additional loss in the switch element itself. Okay? And at high frequencies, because the semiconductor switches, they are made of a, usually a semiconductor material, which at high frequencies, they exhibit themselves as somewhat conductive and, uh, and also somewhat like a dielectric material. So they exhibit a certain level of parasitic capacitance, which limits uh, their isolation in the off state. And isolation here basically means how well you can disconnect the two signals. And when signals uh, are at, at very high frequencies, there is no this concept of an open circuit. Any open circuit, as long as you have the two terminals close to each other, uh, there is a little bit of a capacitance that helps to leak the signal through. So uh, this semiconductor-based uh, uh, materials is not very amenable to uh, high isolation. And in comparison, when we look at the MEMS implementation, right, when we look at uh, an implementation based on mechanically breaking and connecting two pieces of metal, uh, it is actually very nice in terms of electrical performance. Because now we are talking about a real resistor. It's not a semiconductor material that is simulating a resistor. It's a real resistor between two pieces of metals. And therefore, and if we're using highly conductive metals, then uh, the resistance can be really, really small. And therefore, that translates to uh, a low uh, loss in the, in, the, in the switch. And also, because we're talking about a real resistor, it is extremely linear. It doesn't involve semiconductor materials with all the different carrier types and all that. Uh, so we're here just talking about a true uh, resistor, which is a linear device up to very high power levels. And also the switch that I showed before, uh, when you move the, uh, the movable part, there is really no current uh, flowing. So here we use electrostatic force to, a, to attract the movable part to bend to make a contact with the other uh, electrode. So it's an open circuit all the time. So there is no significant bias current needed. And all you need is a little bit of a displacement current because of that actuation capacitance change. And effectively, we're talking about really, really low current or power consumption, right? Almost uh, negligible uh, consumption. So in terms of RF performance, RF MEMS switches are really ideal devices. They do have a, a few limitations, and one of them is a limited actuation speed. Okay, so that is uh, a disadvantage, and depending on the application, that may render the switch usable or unusable. And because here we rely on mechanical movement, right, we do need something to move to make a contact. Even though this uh, small mechanical part is small in dimension, it takes finite uh, amount of time. It takes an appreciable amount of time when you compare it with the movement of electrons and holes. Uh, and here, usually, we're talking about tens of microsecond to uh, maybe in the range of 100 to 200 microsecond. And in comparison, electronic switches, semiconductor switches, they can turn on and off in the range of picoseconds. So there are a few orders of magnitude. But again, depending on the application, uh, you may find this uh, uh, um, uh, a real need, or maybe it doesn't, uh, it doesn't matter that much. So before we talk about uh, all the performance quantitatively, I would like to give a real brief introduction of you know, what specifications we look at when we measure or when we look at the performance of a uh, RF a switch. And here, in general, for any high-frequency electronic devices, we are primarily concerned with uh, a few uh, parameters here. So because we're dealing with electronic energy and high, at high frequencies, we are uh, mostly concerned with uh, power generation transmission, okay? And it's generally 
somewhat expensive in the terms of it's, it's difficult uh, to generate high frequency power. So when we send some electronic power to a device, we usually do not want that power to be reflected. At high frequencies, we talk about uh, voltage and current in terms of waves. So we think of them as if they are, for example, water waves. And uh, if a wave hits an ob obstacle, it may be reflected or it may pass through this device. So generally, we would like to have low reflection and we would like to have a good transmission, especially in the context of a switch. We want all the incoming power to go to the other side if the switch is connected and we don't want much of it to be reflected. So quantitatively, we use uh, these parameters that we call scattering parameters, right? As if the device is some object that is going to scatter the incoming wave. And one parameter is called S11. That means the reflected power divided by the input power at port one of the device, at the left side of the device. So that is a measure of how much is being reflected. And obviously, we would want this parameter to be very, very low uh, normally. Uh, and another parameter here is called S21, which means how much power is transmitted to port two in comparison with how much power is being fed into port one. So this is a ratio between the transmitted power versus the input power. And in general, we would want this number to be really close to one. Right? We want all of the power to go through. And here are some examples that uh, we'll see a little bit later, uh, more examples. So S21, when we have an off state, well, maybe we should talk about the on state. When the, in the on state, the switch connects two circuits together. And obviously, you want all the power to go through. And therefore, you would like to have the S21 as close to zero uh, uh, or as close to one as possible. And when we express it in terms of dB in the log scale, log scale, we would like the S21 to be as close to zero dB as possible. And similarly, we would like the reflection to be really, really low. In the linear scale, we would like it to be close to zero. And in the dB scale, it better be a very large negative dB number. And in the off state, when the switch breaks open, uh, we don't want anything to go through. So in this case, we would like the S21, which measures the transmission, we would like the S21 to be really low. Again, close, ideally close to zero dB. So we would call this guy, the S21, the transmission in the on state, as the insertion loss, the loss characteristics of the switch. And this guy, S11 in the on state, uh, return loss, measuring how much is being reflected. And then the S21 in the off state, the isolation, right? How well it can block power from going through the switch uh, when it is open. And here, one graph shows a comparison of these three parameters between MEMS switches and other technologies. So what we're seeing here on the top of the graph shows the insertion loss in the on state. How much of a loss do I have when a signal goes through the switch? So we see that MEMS uh, stands out on the top uh, by having very, very low insertion loss, right? Almost zero dB, which means almost all the power goes through. And then in the bottom, of, in the bottom half, we're plotting the S21, the insertion loss uh, uh, in the off state, which we call isolation, right? In the off state, how much of a power goes through? We see that MEMS also stands out, MEMS switches also stands out by having very low S21, right? The S21 is in the negative 40, negative 30 dB range, which means very little is going through. So it's, really, it's a really good switch in RF performance, in terms of RF performance. And it's not surprising because in the on state, it is just a very low uh, resistance resistor. In the off state, it's an air gap. You can't get much better than an air gap in terms of isolation. And it does show in realistic devices. So for example, uh, here is a comparison between a set of RF MEMS uh, switches and a set of solid state switches. So this is a gallium arsenide transistor switch in comparison with a MEMS switch in terms of their insertion loss. So you see as the switch gets more complex, right? we're talking about single pole, six 
fourth row and sixth row switches, you see that the uh, difference in the performance gets uh, really big. And you would see a similar trend at higher frequencies. And by the way, this plot is generated at 20 gigahertz. So if you go even higher in frequency, uh, we're going to see a bigger gap between these uh, two types of uh, devices. And by the way, here is plotted the insertion loss. The loss is plotted in dB scale. So this is the S21 in dB scale. And we can see that for a solid state switch, up there, we're talking about almost 3 dB of loss. And 3 dB um, is about one half, right? If you have 3 dB loss, then that means one half of the power is lost in the switch versus this case where you have about one dB, which is about 80 some percent uh, of uh, power that is being preserved. So there is quite a bit of a difference in terms of dB scale. It's differed by one or two, but if you look at the linear difference, it's quite a bit. And therefore, RF switches, RF MEM switches can find you know, a lot of applications. And uh, here are some examples in the interest of time. I will just uh, skip through this. You can use them to uh, turn in and out certain components to make your electronic system tunable, for example. Um, and we'll just go and take a very brief look at how we design these switches or how we make them. Right. So here is a, a very basic knowledge for a mechanical engineering student. We're looking at the switch, a very simplified model of the switch. We already said that it's a suspended microstructure on top of a planar substrate. And when we move this uh, armature here up and down, we use an electrostatic force to attract it. So if the switch, for example, is grounded and you apply a positive voltage at an electrode here, the electrostatic attraction would pull them together. And now because the electrode is fixed, the switch tends to bend downwards to make contact with the other electrode. Uh, and in terms of the modeling, we treat the movable part as a really simple beam here. So it's fixed on one end and it is uh, free to bend, uh, especially at the tip. And we can model uh, the mechanical behavior by looking at you know, how easy it is to deflect a beam like this. And I'm sure you all know that, you know, the stiffness you can readily calculate from the material composition and the dimensions of the switch. So basically here we treat it as what we call a spring mass model. So as if it is, uh, it has a certain spring constant and a little bit of mass, okay? And we can model this uh, by this simplified block diagram. This guy is able, is free to move up and down, but fix at both ends with a little bit of a spring constant. And here we apply a voltage which generate an electrostatic force. And you can calculate how much force you have, and then you can plug in uh, the equation that describes the motion of the switch. Now what is interesting in such a configuration is that uh, obviously the more voltage you apply, uh, the more bending you are going to have because the more electrostatic force you're going to have. But what is interesting is that the electrostatic force increases with one over uh, G squared relationship. And G is the gap, is the separation between the movable part and the electrode. So when the gap becomes small, the electrostatic force increases with the square of the separation. And if we treat the beam as still working in the linear region, its mechanical restoring force is a linear function. So at some point, uh, the balance breaks, and we see an instability in the beam's uh, uh, dynamic behavior. So you can apply a voltage, and the beam would bend, and we're plotting the gap, the separation between the beam and the electrode. So we see that the gap decreases and decreases. But at some point, the electrostatic force is going to increase at a much greater rate than your mechanical force, which is a linear function with gap. And what you're going to see is that it will snap into the other electrode in almost instantly. So there is an instability uh, here. And this part of the curve, this is the solution to the previous equation, this part of the curve uh, is essentially very uh, unstable. You almost never go to that part of the curve and you would just snap in. So we call this uh, the pull-in effect or the snap-in effect. And if we look at this curve, uh, 
uh, the snapping effect occurs at about one uh, two third of the original separation. So the beam will deflect by about one third of the original gap, and then it will go to the other electrode almost instantly, which is a nice feature if you're looking for a switch. You would like the switch to turn on and off uh, immediately. And it is also nice in the sense that here we have a voltage, right? We have a set voltage that, uh, beyond, that, that says beyond this voltage, the beam will be pulled down. It will be in the down state for sure, and below this voltage, it will be in the up state. So in terms of uh, circuit design, it makes our life easier because as long as your voltage is above a certain threshold, I am guaranteed that the switch is going to close. So I don't need precise control in terms of how much voltage I apply to the switch. All right, so I'll skip these in the interest of time. Um, now, you know, having talked about all these nice behaviors or the nice characteristics about RFMEMS switches, um, you know, we will start talking about some of the problems that, that they have, right? Uh, so the first RFMEMS switch was probably proposed in the late 90s uh, or the mid 90s, and since then it's been about 20 years or so. There's been a lot of research going on, and obviously there have been companies trying to commercialize RFMEMS switch uh, for various applications. Uh, a number of companies try to make these switches for cell phone markets, uh, where we use switches to switch in between frequencies and or switch in between transmit and receive mode in a, in a duplex mode. Um, but uh, I would say most of the companies uh, uh, failed in their commercialization effort, and there are practical problems with uh, RF MEM switch, and one of the most uh, impor one of the most um, uh, important issue here is the reliability of the switches. So, and you can probably see that intuitively. Here we have two mechanical parts that are making contact with each other. So you naturally probably would ask the question: Would I have some mechanical tear and wear uh, on the on the surfaces of the contact, and would that impact? Uh, the lifetime of the switch, or would there be uh, mechanical failures inside the material uh, or fatigue inside the material? So indeed, there are uh, a number of issues that plague RFMEMS switch in general, um, and I'm listing a few here. For example, contamination. These, because we're talking about real mechanical movement, uh, it's probably in, you know intuitive to to understand that. We want the switch to be sealed, and we do not like uh, contaminants to go in between the two parts, because here we're talking about really small dimensions in the range of a few, uh, a few micrometers. And if, for somehow, your packaging is not done well, uh, contaminants could be an issue. Moisture and, or other, any other type of particle may cause the switch to fail. And residual stress is uh, another uh, issue here, especially during the fabrication of the switch, if you have an uncontrolled residual stress, when you deposit all these different layers of metal, you may have a switch that come out and not have the exact shape that you designed for. They may be bending up excessively or they may be bending down, meaning that they are always in the closed uh, position. And contact damage, I mentioned uh, that a little bit, when you have two surfaces bombarding each other repeatedly, you may have an issue. And we'll look at that in more detail later on. And um, I'll skip the dielectric charging. But the other more severe problem is high power breakdown. Okay? Uh, essentially, when you have a voltage being applied across the two parts uh, of the switch, you may have uh, an electric breakdown which exacerbates a lot of the mechanical wear problems. So here we have uh, some examples. This is a contact dimple, right? the part that makes contact um, after, right after fabrication for a particular RF MEMS switch. So this is made out of about 250 nanometer uh, gold deposited on uh, the substrate. And it, it's a really nice uh, contact. You know, there are surface roughness, uh, obviously, that's unavoidable, but it's a nice and smooth contact. So after about 1,000 cycles, after about 1,000 cycles mechanical contact with about 200 micronewton force, you see that the surface starts to 
morph. And not surprisingly, because this is gold. Gold, we know, is a soft material, and they would deform a little bit as you make contacts repeatedly. And in some cases, this is not a bad thing, because when we think about contact resistance between two pieces of metals, we don't want them to come in contact like this. We would rather uh, to have them come in contact like this. A larger contact area usually means a smaller contact resistance. So this is not bad to have. You have some sort of a flattish surface from the mechanical bombardment uh, that gives you uh, a lower contact resistance. However, if you do this for too much, right, if you do it for too much, you see that the surface starts to wear starts to wear out. And there could be a number of issues here. There could be just stiction and material transfer, and there could be other electrical damages. And here we, ha we start to have a, a real problem because you see the surface becomes uh, rougher. And we explained before, if the surface is rough, then they don't make good contacts. And as a result, the contact resistance increases. So if you have some current running through it, an increased resistance means an increased amount of heat being generated. And if you have increased heat, then the material becomes softer. And if it is softer, it's more prone to damage. So you sort of get in this vicious cycle in terms of uh, reliability. So here we show uh, this example we showed before as an exemplary RFMEMS uh, switch device. Uh, it is very reliable when operated at low power. So uh, official test results have shown that we are talking about a lifetime of approaching a trillion cycles. So you can turn these on and off uh, for a trillion cycles uh, without, uh, you know, without the switch going out of spec. And in comparison, our circuit breakers on the wall, we're talking about maybe a million cycles or so. So there is quite a bit of a difference here. So in terms of a low power switch, this is really, really uh, reliable. But when you uh, turn up the power, when you increase the amount of RF power that goes through the switch, we see that the switch lifetime degrades almost exponentially. So the one trillion cycle is measured probably at you know, close to uh, one milliwatt or maybe even lower. But if we were to turn up the power into the range of 10 to tw 10 milliwatt to 100 milliwatt, we see that the lifetime degrades to a few thousand cycles. So a very stark contrast here, a trillion versus a few thousand. After a few thousand cycles, the switch essentially fails to perform. Um, so what is the issue here? The issue here is that whenever you have a voltage difference as the switch closes, there is this, always this instant in time where the separation is extremely small. And it's inevitable, if you have a voltage difference, that it's going to break down across this gap. And the breakdown event means a sudden rush of current and generation of heat and probably bombardment by the electrons and all that running across the boundary. So this breakdown event causes a lot of damage to the surface. And that is why uh, we are talking about you know, fairly poor lifetime when the switch is being turned on and off with some RF power uh, going through it. So one of the uh, research work we have done in our research group is uh, to look at how we solve this problem. And we have a simple and almost cheating uh, <laughs> solution to it, is that we realize that we can, instead of you know, letting the switch to, uh, to go through this damaging event, we can probably put some protection contacts along with the switches. We, in other words, we put some switches that could sacrifice themselves in protection of the main switch we would like to have. So here we have two switches in parallel. One of them is a low resistance, uh, low contact resistance switch, and the other is a high uh, contact resistance switch, but probably made out of a material that is resistant to these kind of damages. For example, for a low contact switch, you would like to use a highly conductive material like gold, copper, or silver. And unfortunately, these metals are all very soft, right? But for the protection switch, you could use a high hardness uh, material. And in our preliminary experiment, we used uh, just platinum uh, as, as an example. Um, so the idea here is when you put the two in parallel, uh, 
your total resistance is really just determined by the lower of the two, right? If you have, you can keep the low contact resistance switch, your total resistance does not change too much. But by doing this, you could protect uh, that low contact resistance switch. So always you would turn on or off the uh, protection switch first. And when that happens, the potential difference between the switch would be drastically dropped across that protection switch. And if the voltage difference is dropped, the amount of current that runs through that breakdown event would be significantly reduced. And here we show a structure where uh, through some mechanical design, uh, we can realize this protection sequence all in one structure without having to use two sets of different actuation voltages. And here the idea is uh, fairly simple. So we have uh, a slightly more complex beam like this. And when you increase the actuation voltage, the beam will touch down on the other end at its very tip. So the tip will touch down first, but this touchdown is not the real contact that we want to use. This is the protection contact. And as you pull it down even further, the beam will start bending on itself. So it tends to bend downwards. And here we have the real contact slightly at some distance uh, away from the tip. So afterwards, after you make the protection contact, you will then make the real contact. Uh, and in this sequence, we will be able to protect the low resistance contact. So here I'm showing essentially the switch sequence. And um, I will skip uh, through the modeling part of it. Uh, but intuitively, you can understand that if you're already shorting the two electrodes with some level of resistance, then the voltage across them would be greatly reduced. And therefore, we're seeing a much uh, reduced electrical field uh, w without and with protection contact, the electric field drops by tenfold for a protection contact that is around 10 ohm or so, which is not difficult to achieve. Usually for uh, low contact re uh, uh, resistance, we're able to hit about half an ohm to an ohm range. And for a high hardness contact, 10 ohm is not difficult to achieve. And here we've also did uh, we've also done some uh, uh, theoretical analysis in terms of the behavior of uh, the bending of the beam and all that, in which I won't bore you with the math. Uh, but, you know, th a theory agrees with our simulation fairly well in the sense that, you know, as you pull down, you do see this bending behavior. And in particular, if you look at the contact force, right, the force uh, uh, that the beam is making with the substrate of the two contacts, you see that... Here we make the first contact, and the contact force increases to a point where we make the second contact. The second contact starts to come up, and as we bend it even more, the first contact tends to bend up a little bit. So we're seeing the contact resistance uh, decre uh, decre um, decreasing for the first contact. Okay, some RF uh, performance simulations basically showing in terms of RF performance, this works really well uh, also. And we fabricated the switches in-house in the College of Engineering clean room here. Uh, and here are some uh, uh, optical images and SEM pictures. So the nominal dimensions for the switch, um, I think it is about 200 micrometers long. And the separation here is about 0.9 micrometers a small gap in between. And we have these two sets of contacts. So we've done lifetime uh, measurement, and here are some snippets of RF measurement basically showing that they are uh, as expected in terms of uh, uh, RF performance, uh, performing really well up to about 40 gigahertz. And the real um, uh, result I would like to present here is the uh, cycling lifetime. Okay, so here uh, is a pure mechanical test. So we do not apply any power, and we just bombard the switch on and off to see what is the limitation in terms of just mechanical bombardment. And here uh, it is about 100 million cycles or so. Now, interestingly, so about, about 100 million cycles, the surfaces becomes rougher and the contact resistance increases. Uh, but interestingly, when you apply... Uh, RF power, or when you apply electric current, you will see the lifetime of the switch increase dramatically. And the reason for that, we believe, is that when you feed power through it, the heating of, from the current 
can actually soften the material and therefore in part heals the uh, rough surfaces because of mechanical damage. So when you have current going through, it actually works a little bit better. But if you have too much current going through, obviously you will damage the contacts from a different set of mechanisms. So here we compare uh, our switches. We fabricated switches both with the protection scheme and without the protection scheme as a control. So we see here that uh, we have some really surprising, or perhaps not surprising, result. Um, when we pass one watt of power, one watt is you know a thousand times of a milliwatt. Um, we see a, a drastic difference between the lifetime. If we do not have the protection, this is somewhat as expected. The contact resistance starts rising, okay. And in here, we all start off with about one ohm of contact resistance, which is a fairly usable RF switch. But as soon as you go above three or four uh, ohm, it becomes rather lossy. So we see about you know, one million cycles or so, we're hitting about five ohm of contact resistance for unprotected switch. While our protected switch remains very low, remains below one ohm, all the way till about 100, milli, 100 million cycles or so. So put this in perspective, we talked about a commercial RF MEM switch, which would fail after a few thousand cycles, in with about 100 milliwatt. And here we have a switch that passes through one watt and does not fail until about 100 million cycles or so. And here is another set of measurement. We are passing two watts, right? The more power you, you pump through it, uh, the, more, the faster it, it, gets, it gets damaged. And here we're talking about, you know, again, 100 million cycles or so of lifetime. So this is, um, you know, I would say a few orders of magnitude better than uh, what we have seen on the market and also in terms of academic uh, publications. So I think I'm almost running out of time here, uh, but I, hopefully I've captured the essence of the research work. There is a complementary design that we uh, invested also. So in, in the previous uh, a few slides, we have two switches put in parallel. And you can think about this protection scheme having another variant. We can put, put the protection switch uh, in shunt. So we can put this guy, this uh, protection squi uh, switch in red, uh, directly connecting it to the ground. So that will also short the input and output terminals. Uh, so it serves the same purposes. And I won't go into the details. So it turns out if you do the ele electrical modeling, uh, you will find that this uh, second scheme is not as effective in terms of lowering the voltage difference between the two electrodes. So its protection effect is slightly uh, worse than the first uh, scheme, but an added benefit of the second scheme is that, oops, flipping too fast, <laughs> uh, is that now you have two switches effectively, one in series and the other in shunt. So the shunt switch will uh, feed the incoming signal to ground, while the series switch will block the incoming signals. So you almost uh, have two switches in this scenario. And it, what it helps is in the off-state isolation. So we're seeing a great difference in the off-state off isolation. So if your application calls for good isolation in the off-state, you probably can sacrifice the lifetime a little bit uh, in exchange for a very much improved isolation in the off-state. So that's the merit of this second scheme. Again, we tested, we fabricated and tested the switches in our lab, and we're seeing a very similar result in terms of lifetime. So we're seeing, again, close to 100 million cycles under one watt of operating power. And in both cases, uh, the, the real failure mechanism is the, protections, is the protection switch. So after enough time, it's damaged so much that it wouldn't actuate because of stiction or some other problems. Uh, but you could think of making the protection switch out of a different technology. So we do this because it's easy to do. We can do all the design in-house. If somehow you can integrate, for example, a high voltage handling semiconductor switch, and now we have these technologies like gallium nitride, for example, can handle tens of volts uh, without ever breaking down. So it is possible to have a very, very reliable shunt switch and a very, very low contact resistance main switch. So that's about 
uh, about it for my part of the talk. Uh, so essentially, we've presented uh, uh, in this talk uh, a very brief introduction of what RF MEM switches are, what the problems they have, and uh, some of the ideas that we came up with and uh, validated uh, on how we improve the reliability of these switches. And I have a few more slides on on some of the other stuff that may be related to mechanical engineering. I have been uh, purely out of personal interest ad advising some electrical engineering students on small UAV technologies, uh, uh, basically small drones. Uh, my interest is not so much on constructing or the mechanical design aspect of it. Uh, like I mentioned before, I work in wireless uh, and high-frequency electronics, and in particular, we have several research projects on building small and low power radar sensors. So uh, my interest here is to do remote sensing with radars and hopefully on these uh, small UAV platforms. So over the last uh, two to three years, uh, I've advised uh, a few teams. Um, they've been working on various aspects. Some of them are building the platform. Some of them are interested in machine learning, navigation, or, um, or one project that we have um, last year was to use these small drones as a data collector for wireless sensor networks. Because one outstanding problem for these wireless sensor networks is that the sensor node uh, does not have sufficient battery lifetime. Because we're talking about a sensor that you're going to disperse into a field uh, you know, some 20 miles away, and you don't want to change battery for it all the time. So, we thought it may be interesting to use these platforms as a data collector or maybe even as a wireless power charger to these sensors. And hopefully that will resolve uh, some of these problems that we're seeing. So uh, this is an area that I can see some uh, synergy with the mechanical engineering department as well. I've actually been working with uh, Professor Kong uh, on, these, uh, on this front already. So I've dragged along a little too long. <laughs> we have a few minutes. Thank yeah. You very much. That was very <laughs> so we take, we got uh, three minutes to take a few questions from the audience, and if you don't mind repeating. Uh, any questions? I want folks. Unless somebody has something. Yeah, I do. Uh, <clears throat> so you said the switching time for these uh, switches is a couple microseconds. Yeah, in the, uh, so the question is uh, the switching time for the RFMEM switches. They're in the range of tens of microseconds to about 200 microseconds. Okay, I guess my question is, if you're talking about doing things on the RF frequency and gigahertz level, how does this switching time work for that? Right, very good question. Uh, with this slow of a switching time, it is not very useful as uh, something that will actively change uh, the circuit behavior at the RF rate. Okay. But it will be useful as a, a component to reconfigure your circuits. And one example that RF MEM switches are now finding use and finding acceptance in the market is what we call antenna tuners. So when we uh, uh, take our cell phones, there are antennas inside the cell phone. And the interesting behavior here is that if you put it around your head, the, the bodily uh, fluid is going to impact the performance of the antenna. So you're going to see an impedance mismatch on, on the antennas. So we use these switches to have a variable matching network for the antennas. And here we're not talking about very fast uh, switching event, right? You put it, your phone against the head, you only need to switch probably once every few seconds or maybe once every few minutes. Uh, so switching speed is not critical in terms when you use it as a reconfiguration device. Okay, one more quick one. I was curious, uh, briefly, you mentioned fatigue at one point, but why, why don't we see the failure in the trillion cycles? Okay, yeah, so we don't really see fatigue failure in these switches. Uh, uh, but we do, okay, so the question is uh, the f fatigue uh, effects in the, in the switches. Uh, we don't really see fatigue, uh, but we see, um, I, I guess I'm not an expert on this. We see something very similar. Uh, uh, we call it viscoelasticity. Uh, essentially, it is a material property change when the material undergoes too much stress for too long. So what you will see, what you will see here is that the actuation voltage, the pull-in voltage of the switch, if you actuate it too much, 
or if you hold it down too much, which means that the anchor is experiencing a lot of stress, that the voltage will change over time. So the switch usually becomes softer and softer over time, but you can build in uh, a healthy margin when you do the design, right? For example, if your uh, pull-in voltage is designed to be 30 volts, you probably actuate it at 45, uh, making sure that it will actuate and making sure you have margin uh, for this type of uh, behavior. Yeah. Great. I think that's all for today.